Good morning and welcome to this service of Holy Communion and Christian worship from provided by St Luke's Church in Hawkinge, Kent. If you're joining us for the very first time this morning, you're very welcome. It's lovely to have you along. If you found us on the internet, you're also very welcome. But of course, you're very specially welcome if you're a member of the St Luke's family. Well, it's been another one of those weeks, isn't it? It seems that autumn is now here. Well, the weather has uh, certainly shown that. Well, the least said about the weather, the better, eh? Well, let's take a few moments now to step aside from the world and to worship our God and our King. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And our first hymn this morning, All Creatures of Our God and King. him that is. But now we say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, 
through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, Love your neighbour as yourself, and there is no other commandment greater than these, and on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Hear what comfortable words our Saviour Christ says to all who truly turn to him. Come to me all that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that all that believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Hear also what St Paul says. This is a true saying and worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the perfect offering for our sins, and not only for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Let us therefore confess our sins together in penitence and faith, as we say, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Rob. We say together now the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you only are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. A collect for today, which is the 16th Sunday after Trinity. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in you. Pour your love into our hearts and draw us to yourself, and so bring us at last to your heavenly city, where we shall see you face to face, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Our readings for today. The first of those readings comes from St Paul's epistle to the Philippians. And we're going to read chapter 3. And we're going to start at the second half of verse 4 and go on to verse 14. If anyone thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. 
circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteous, that is, in the law, blameless. But everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them filth, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Not that I've already reached the goal or am already fully mature, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We now have our Gospel reading for this week, which comes from the Gospel of St Matthew chapter 21 and we're going to read verse 33 to the end that's Matthew 21 33 to the end listen to another parable there was a man a landowner who planted a vineyard put a fence around it dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower he leased it to tenant farmers and went away when the grape harvest drew near, he sent his slaves to the farmers to collect his fruit. But the farmers took his slaves, beat one, killed another and stoned a third. Again he sent other slaves, more than the first group, and they did the same to them. Finally he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenant farmers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those farmers? He will completely destroy those terrible men, they told him, and lease his vineyard to the other farmers who will give him his produce at the harvest. Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This came from the Lord and is wonderful in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation producing its fruit. Whoever falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whoever it falls, it will grind him to powder. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they knew he was speaking about them. Although they were looking for a way to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And now it's time for us to sing again. Let's sing together, Behold Our God.
continuing our series in Philippians, and this week we're at the end of chapter 1. Now, we know that Paul was imprisoned at the time of writing, and last week we saw how Paul was able to see how his confinement had helped to advance the gospel, as he was now sharing the gospel with his guards, and the Philippian Christians, well, they'd become emboldened, hadn't they, through Paul's experience. Our passage for today is the final few verses of chapter 1, and we're starting at verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you, or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Well, before this passage, Paul has been through an amazing period of reflection, where he weighs up two options, release and or death. And he knows that as a result of his imprisonment he may be facing death and he declares in the face of this that he's not afraid of that prospect. Verse 19, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed but will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. He reveals two wonderful ways in which God is with us during such times of extremity. That God's people are praying, and that God's Spirit is present. And it's good, isn't it, when we're able to tell similar stories of knowing that we're carried on other people's prayers, knowing God's presence as we have an operation, experience illness or loss, or just generally face difficult circumstances. Now Paul doesn't know what the outcome is going to be. What will be the deliverance or the salvation he refers to? What will it look like? Will it be the prison busting experience of Peter that we heard about last week? Or Will it be the martyrdom that Stephen faced in Acts 7 when he was stoned? Or James, the brother of John, who was beheaded in Acts 12? Well, Paul provides a perspective that's really helpful when we're faced with difficulties, as he confronts the two possible outcomes, release, that's life, or death. He prays for courage to face the uncertain future, and also that he will not be ashamed in any way. Now, we just don't know exactly what Paul meant by these remarks. But it would seem that he was wrestling with and trying to come to terms with how he will respond to what might happen to him. Now, I've just said that it's great to hear stories of God's provision and deliverance. But there's a danger that we only tell, let's call them, the success stories. Very early on in the pandemic, I was speaking to a dear friend who had been really close to death through the virus. And the mental and the emotional turmoil that he went through and the desperation he felt. I initially found the, the conversation really unsettling and he'd found the whole experience very unsettling and disturbing. But here's the point. Before Jesus speaks peace to the storm, his followers are despairing of life, and indeed despairing of Jesus. They say, don't you care that we perish? You can find that in Mark chapter 4. Now, I recently had to do what was called an online situational judgment test, which was all about how someone should respond in certain situations. Well, between you and me, that's easy. I know how I should respond. But in the situation itself, I don't know 
if it is how I will respond. Knowing it is one thing, doing it in the heat of the moment, well, that's quite another thing, isn't it? But God knows. God knows. He still loves us and is with us when we feel that we're not responding in the way that we think Christians should respond. But we'll come back to that thought a little bit later. Well, through whatever Paul was going through, he reaches this conclusion. Verse 21. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now for Paul, this is clearly the ultimate win-win situation, isn't it? And he allows himself to think through both possibilities. Heaven and freedom from suffering and seeing Jesus face to face. Well, that's a million times better, isn't it, than Paul's present situation in prison or under house arrest and possibly facing death. But yes, yet there's the sense that God wants him to continue with his earthly ministry and that there is unfinished business at Philippi and in other cities. Now, of course, no one is indispensable. No one is able to go on forever. Works need to be handed over. The next generation needs to take its place and so on. But Paul was convinced, verse 25, that he was going to be around at least in the short term. And this is why Paul starts our passage with, whatever happens. He doesn't know. Although Paul is convinced he will carry on with the ministry, the future, his future, that of the church at Philippi is ultimately in God's hands. Whatever happens. This isn't Paul saying, Ki sera, sera, what will be, will be. He knows that God holds the future. There's an old hymn that comes to mind that something, sums things up really well. And the first verse and the chorus are this. I do not know what lies ahead. The way I cannot see. Yet one stands near to be my guide. He'll show the way to me. I know who holds the future. And he'll guide me with his hand. With God, things don't just happen. Everything by him is planned. So as I face tomorrow with its problems large and small, I'll trust the God of miracles, give to him my all. Well, having shared on a very personal level, Paul then gives two charges to the Philippian church. The first is this, verse 27, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now this was not just to the Philippian church, to the Ephesians he wrote, as a prisoner for the Lord, same circumstances, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. To the Colossian Christians, you may live a life worthy of the Lord. Well, whatever it means, we can work out that it was important to Paul as it comes in more than one of his letters. So it wasn't something that was just for the Philippian church and perhaps only them. It would seem to be central to all his, the, ch the churches and the teaching that he gave them. But there was, however, something that was special to Philippi that may help us understand what Paul was saying. You see, Philippi was a very Roman city, even though it was in the eastern part of Greece, Macedonia. It had been made a Roman colony by Caesar Augustus, which brought the privileges and prestige of Roman citizenship. And in his account in Acts, Luke accurately described the city as being, I quote, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. There was a pressure to live up to the Roman standards and conform to the Roman ways of life. Perhaps it would be drummed into the children. This is how Romans behave, or this is not the way a Roman would do it. Many of us have experienced similar things, haven't we? Whether at home or at school or at work or in a relationship. Living up to the expectations of others or certain standards. The pressure to conform, the pressure to achieve and succeed, to be somebody. Nothing's changed, does it? I guess the alarm bells might be ringing. Is Paul going down that line? 
Well, yes and no. It would have been something that Philippians would have been familiar with. You call yourself a Roman? Well, live as a Roman. But Paul was just about to turn the whole thing on its head. As everything that defined a Roman citizen in terms of his or her ultimate allegiance to Caesar and conformity to Roman law and the way of life and the pride and the superiority, superiority that went with it, you knew you were the best of the best. That was not what living a life worthy of Christ and the gospel was about. Bit of a sneaky preview of next week's talk. But living a life worthy of the gospel of Christ is going to be about living in selfless and sacrificial service as Jesus did. But more of that next week. Though you might want to read the second chapter of Philippians just to get the heads up on it. Well, the second charge is this. And again, it's in verse 27. Stand firm. I guess we can all define the conditions that we feel are most beneficial to us as Christians. And I'm sure that a lot of the things that would be on any list we come up with have been denied in recent months, especially in terms of being together. I've no doubt the Philippians loved it when Paul was with them. They had a special relationship with him. And I'm sure many would be able to testify to great times of experience and growth under his ministry. But Paul says, take me out of the equation. Whether I'm with you or not, it's not the issue. I want you to stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Now, the very first church I led was in quite a state when I took over. At one time, long before I took over, it had been the largest church in the area. But it had shrunk considerably, and few thought the church really had a future. Well, because of the state of the church, I was able to make some changes which possibly wouldn't have been allowed if things had been going really well. And one was that I knew it was going to be incredibly tough for Cathy and myself. And we were able to form what I called a core team of those who were committed to seeking God for the future of the church and who would also support us in our ministry. Well, it was tough. It was even tougher than I knew it was going to be. And at times I was so close to giving up. And I remember one elderly lady who had been at the church for most of her adult life, a lovely person. She gave me this cartoon. It was God's call to me to stand firm. And it was as if the only strength I had was to stop myself being consumed by the situation. Well, remember we said at the beginning that central to what was sustaining Paul and enabling him to carry on were two things. The unity that came from the partnership of prayer and the help that came through the Holy Spirit. Well, here it is again. Stand firm in the one spirit striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. And a bit like Paul, through people's prayers and the help given by the Holy Spirit, we were able to see things slowly change and move forward. And an important part of that was that I was able to stand firm. Boy, there were some really, really big wobbles but this is where we come up against some of the less helpful thoughts we can have about what Christians should do and how we should behave. And because we think this way, we can so easily be condemned by the thought that Christians ought not to be thinking this or feeling this. But listen carefully. Standing firm is about carrying on when you want to give up. Standing firm is about staying around when you want to run away. Standing firm is about staggering back onto your feet when you've been badly knocked down. Standing firm is about choosing and continuing to trust when you've been hurt and bruised by others. Standing firm 
can involve wobbles and not just little ones, really big ones. And above all, standing firm is receiving the love and support of other believers and receiving the help that God wants to give through his Holy Spirit. Now the last few months have seen many of us isolated through sheltering, the various restrictions and just the general loss of human and social interaction. So I want to finish by praying that God will help each one of us to stand firm. And I want to encourage anyone who is watching or listening to this not to give up, but to ask for prayer. Yes, it can be a humbling experience to say how we feel. And we can feel a little bit ashamed when we talk about wanting to give up and what our feelings are. But there is help and there is a way forward. I just want to add one specific thought before I pray. And I feel that this is a specific word for somebody. And that is to not, to not entertain the thought that if God really loved you and cared about where you were and what you were thinking, he would prompt someone to call you. Please don't go there. That's really all about self-pity. Instead, if God has spoken to you today, that I want to encourage you to pick up the phone, write an email, send a text, just be honest and ask for help. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you that we confront and, and we can face up to some very real issues when we read your word. And we ask, Lord, that you will enable us to stand firm where we've been wobbling. We ask that you will just bring strength and courage to us. Where we felt like giving up, we pray that you will give us the strength and the courage to, to carry on. Where we've been hurt, we pray, Lord, that we won't harbour those hurts to such an extent that we deny ourselves the solace and the support that you give and that your people can give. So we just pray for the church, for each other. We pray for, for Rob and Sarah, those who lead the church, each one of us, that you will enable us to stand firm and that we will be a, a, a family, a community that is able to pray for each other and to receive the help that your Holy Spirit is able to give. Help us, we pray. We ask this for your glory. Amen. Let's say together the Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now let us come before the Lord in prayer.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we worship and praise you because while all around may be crumbling, you alone remain steadfast and unchanging. You are with us during all the great times and you are still with us when the dark clouds gather. During times of trial or joy, you're there, strong, steadfast and true. Thank you that the doorway of prayer, which leads directly into your very presence, is open to us, and that all our individual prayers are heard. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, once again we pray for the worldwide revival of your church, and we add our prayers this morning to those of Archbishop Ben Kawashi, leader of the Global Union of Anglicans, GAFCON, when he prayed these words. I want the Bible taught with clarity, integrity and conviction. I want the Bible lived out in real life, changing lives and communities everywhere. I want truth, righteousness and justice to be common in the life of the church amongst believers and extended to the world. I want the mission of the gospel to be a living presence of the church, insisting on conversion, experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit and bearing the fruit of the Spirit as a mark of discipleship. I want this ministry to children, youth, widows, orphans, aged and helpless to be a regular mission of the church. May the word of God spread with speed. May the gospel of salvation be preached to the world. May the Spirit of God fall afresh on us. May the name of the Lord alone be glorified. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty and most merciful Father, whose nature is to be compassionate and kind, show mercy and compassion on all who struggle this day with cancer, especially Archbishop Ben, on those groaning in pain of the illness and those suffering through the pain of treatment. Give them grace to cast all their cares upon you. Assure them of your presence in their struggles. Heal them by the power of your love through Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for your people here in Hawkinge, and all who join us for this time of online worship, wherever they may be. May we in the week ahead draw closer to you, fill us anew with your Holy Spirit, and grant us a fresh vision that we might be more powerful in our witness to those around us. We pray especially today for our vicar, Rob Grinsell, his wife, Sarah, and their son, Ben. Comfort, restore, and refresh them, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we say together, Lord, in your mercy, we ask that you accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now before we join Rob in the church for Holy Communion, we'll sing together that lovely hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
the Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, we give you thanks and praise for your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word, through whom you've created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh as your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin. He lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. And so he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. Therefore with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and of wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as oft as you shall drink it in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. And as we offer you this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup so that we in the company of all the saints may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom in the unity of the Holy Spirit all honour and glory be yours, almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, grant us peace. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which he gave for you, his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Amen.
Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. So may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, I'm afraid that's all for this week. Thank you very much for joining us. Hope you have a lovely week ahead, despite all the COVID restrictions. May God bless you and keep you safe. And we're with best wishes and our prayers from all of us here at St Luke's in Hawkinge. Goodbye and God bless you. <laughs>